I bid you welcome. Bram Stoker's seminal 1897 novel Dracula was somewhat infamously first adapted for the silver screen by German expressionist filmmaker F. W. Murnau, with 1922's Nosferatu. While character names had been changed, the story more or less followed the plot of the book, and due to misunderstandings regarding copyright laws, neither Murnau nor its production company, Prana Films, had acquired the rights to the late author's novel, and his widow, Florence Stoker, rightfully sued the production for copyright infringement and, to no one's surprise, won, resulting in all copies of the film ordered destroyed. While we now know that several prints fortunately survived this fiasco, it left the literary classic having yet to be officially translated to film and what is perhaps now its most defining adaptation had yet to come. Of course, it would not only be the first authorized film translation of the beloved novel, but the first sound adaptation as well, and would quickly give way to the sprawling Universal Pictures monsterverse, simultaneously creating a new genre for the American moviegoer, the talky horror film. But. Perhaps most importantly, it would change the lives of everyone involved in its making, and not all for the better, and the road to resurrecting Dracula would, much like the film itself, become the thing of myths and legend. Not only being produced amidst an historic economic meltdown, but also plagued by both Hollywood tragedies and a seemingly endless search for the man who would be Dracula all while promising to deliver the story of the strangest passion the world had ever known. The pre-code era of Hollywood was the short interlude between the birth of sound in cinema, or talkies, and the enforcement of the Hayes Code, beginning in 1934. A brief time of unrestricted Wild West filmmaking that not only pushed the limits of good taste, but, in a way, was also an extension of the often violent and hyper-sexualized culture of the Roaring Twenties, with Prohibition still very much in effect. And as hard as it may be to imagine now, this towering classic would be produced by the then inexperienced 23-year-old son of Universal Pictures founder, Carl Lemley Jr., who, in June of 1930, purchased the film rights to Bram Stoker's novel at a cost of $40,000, later buying up the rights to all stage play adaptations as well, therefore ensuring Universal was the sole owner of the Dracula property. Several years earlier, prior to Lemley Jr.'s involvement, Universal had already looked into adapting the novel for the screen as a silent picture, but found its contents too distasteful to be put to film, and so the project was, initially, abandoned. Reportedly, in its earliest conception, the film was meant to be a starring vehicle for the revered German-British actor Conrad Veidt who had most recently gained acclaim for his hauntingly tragic performance in 1928's The Man Who Laughs, which was produced by Carl Lemley Sr. However, the rise of talking pictures had led Veidt to abandon Hollywood altogether and move back to Germany, concerned that his grasp of the English language wasn't strong enough to maintain his career otherwise. Known as a passionate go-getter, by 1929, the then 21-year-old Lemley Jr. would be deemed head of production at Universal Pictures and was eager to make his mark in Hollywood. However, 
At that time, the studio was more or less viewed as second-rate, and its public financial struggles had left the once-revered Hollywood landmark in a state of disrepair. In order to revitalize its luster and the family name, Lemley initially envisioned Dracula as an extravagant and lavish production on the scale of 1923's The Hunchback of Notre Dame or 1925's The Phantom of the Opera, both starring silent horror icon Lon Chaney and being produced by Lemley Sr. Rumors also circulated that Lemley wanted the chameleon performer to play the parts of both the Count and Van Helsing, a common gimmick found in the actor's filmography that had helped him earn the moniker The Man of a Thousand Faces. It should be emphasized that any information regarding Lon Chaney's alleged involvement in the production's development is strictly hearsay, at least to a certain extent, and that few records exist to substantiate this claim. However, I have chosen to include the rumor of Chaney's casting, not only because it still persists today, but because it also cannot be entirely debunked. I'd take it with a grain of salt. Reportedly, Lemley also hoped that Dracula would mark the silent star's first foray into talking pictures. But there was one minor hang-up. Chaney was already under contract with MGM Studios, and had planned on a sound remake of 1925's The Unholy Three being his talky debut. Consequently, Lemley chose to stall the project until Chaney was on the market. While several writers had already helped shape the script, Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist Louis Bromfield was hired to fashion the film into the grand spectacle Lemley sought, the producer having been a fan of the author's 1926 novel, Early Autumn. Frustratingly, Bromfield was met with several structural and logistical obstacles as he worked to seamlessly combine elements from both the novel and the stage play, while remaining faithful to Stoker's story. Bromfield also began the story more in line with the novel, following Jonathan Harker, not Renfield, as he travels to Transylvania to finalize a real estate deal. However, many of the writer's ideas were turned down by the studio, mostly because they were deemed either too expensive or too controversial, and the author eventually parted ways with the producers altogether. And as if the situation wasn't bad enough, their much sought after leading man, Lon Chaney, would sadly not be around to take on the role of a lifetime. Quietly, Chaney had been diagnosed with throat cancer in 1928, and in the summer of 1930, his health took a turn for the worse, and the legendary actor tragically passed away that August at the age of just 47. What's more, the stock market crash of October 1929 would send the world spiraling into a Great Depression, forcing the studio to scale back its budgets and totally reimagine their approach to adapting Dracula. Playwright and screenwriter Garrett Fort, who was best known at the time for penning the groundbreaking 1929 talkie applause, had a reputation for masterfully blending thrills and humor, and was Universal's final choice to adapt Stoker's novel. Fort would avoid many of Bromfield's pitfalls in attempting to translate the novel to the silver screen by doing just the opposite, choosing to turn to Hamilton Dean and John L. Balderston's popular Broadway stage rendition as the sole blueprint for the story. Of course, this meant that the film's narrative would deviate quite heavily from its source material, and now much of what we associate with Dracula originated not in Bram Stoker's novel, but with the stage play. German expressionist filmmaker Paul Lini, a newcomer to Universal Studios, would temporarily be hired to direct the film, having gained acclaim for directing Conrad Veidt in The Man Who Laughs. But his unexpected death in 1929, at the age of just 44, resulted in several filmmakers having been considered to helm the project. But it was on the eve of production that Todd Browning was chosen to serve as Dracula's director and co-producer. 
Browning was primarily known for his contributions to the horror and mystery genres, where he saw frequent collaborations with Lon Chaney, and would come to Dracula following what turned out to be his final film with the late actor. Dubbed the Edgar Allan Poe of cinema by the press, Browning was a true Renaissance man, and in addition to writing and directing, he had also been a stage and film actor, a vaudeville performer, and carnival sideshow and circus personality, and would bring his knack for spooky atmosphere and searing suspense to the vampire genre. Regardless of Lon Chaney's tragic death, Lemley and Browning faced a lengthy casting process for the role of Count Dracula, one where a 48-year-old Hungarian-American stage and film actor named Bela Lugosi was pretty low on Carl Lemley's list of potential stars. While it seems now that it was Lugosi's destiny to be immortalized on film as the iconic character, Lemley first trudged through a long list of big Hollywood names to take on the cape, hoping to match the star power he once held when Cheney's name was attached, with headliners like William Courtney, Paul Mooney, Chester Morris, and John Ray in the running. In 1927, Bela Lugosi began starring as the Count in Dean and Balderston's play, and received steady praise from both critics and audiences over the course of 261 successful New York-based performances. The following year, the production moved west to Los Angeles, where, seeing the opportunity in the American film industry, Lugosi and his family decided to settle, unaware that just two short years later, he would become a living legend of the silver screen. In the end, Lugosi's casting was mostly the result of his own persistence. While he did from time to time find work in smaller roles on low-budget silent and early talkie features, including Todd Browning's 1929 mystery thriller The Thirteenth Chair, the actor all along tirelessly lobbied for the title role of Count Dracula. And over time, Lemley and other Universal executives were won over by the passionate and very affordable future star. Indeed, Lugosi did not win the role without some sacrifice, and agreed to receive the relatively minuscule weekly salary of just $500, and was paid $3,500 in total for his timeless performance, or about $66,000 now. While this obviously isn't chump change, the late Lon Chaney, for example, was said to have been earning Lugosi's entire salary in just one week. To his co-stars, Bela Lugosi was a polite and somewhat distant Eastern European gentleman, if not a little odd. At the same time, others perceived him as a vain and eccentric thespian, a man who took himself and his craft maybe a little too seriously. Cast and crew reported that they would often catch the actor strutting up and down the set with his cape in hand, exclaiming, I am Dracula, apparently Lugosi's attempt at psyching himself into the role. And outside of this and his dialogue, Lugosi is said to have spoken little more than good morning and good night to his co-workers. Insensitive rumors were later spread that the foreign actor was delusional and confused reality with fantasy. This, however, was patently false, as Lugosi's family would later testify. Of course, one might think that this misrepresentation could have been due to his thick Hungarian accent and maybe lack of experience casually conversing in English. But while there is some debate over how well Lugosi handled the language at the time of filming, it is a Hollywood myth that he had to learn all of his lines phonetically. And by 1931, Lugosi spoke the language about as well as he ever would. With its star at last locked in, Browning and Lemley set out to cast the remaining key players. For the significantly downgraded part of the loyal and vigilant John Harker, a young Lou Ayers would first be cast. But after the actor was reassigned to another Universal feature, the role was recast with star Robert Ames. Unfortunately, Ames' sensational divorce from actor and singer Vivian Siegel was too hot to handle for the studio, 
so Ames was lastly replaced by Canadian-American actor David Manners, who was considered an up-and-coming leading man. You're so... like a changed girl. Stage actor Helen Chandler would be hand-picked by Browning to play Mina Seward, the director having been a fan of her performance in the 1928 Broadway hit The Silent House. And at $750 per week, Chandler was the highest-paid member of the entire cast. Sadly, the 25-year-old star was struggling with alcoholism at the time of shooting, which often interfered with her performance and ability to remember her dialogue. It's all over, John. In the years following its release, Chandler was open about not being a fan of the film and felt it ruined her career by typecasting her as a helpless maiden. Gentlemen, we are dealing with the undead. American character actor Edward Van Sloan had already starred as Professor Abraham Van Helsing alongside Lugosi in the Broadway play, and was the natural choice to embody the character for Lemley's film. Although Sloan himself never particularly thought of the role as anything special. While this is certainly considered to be his most popular performance, like co-star Helen Chandler, the actor was not a fan of the finished product, and was always quick to point out its flaws, accusing the film of being overplayed and overwritten. Nonetheless, following Dracula, Sloan would go on to appear in noticeably similar roles in three more Universal Monster pictures. <laughs> Stage actor Bernard Jukes had also fought to reprise his role as Renfield for the big screen but up-and-coming 31-year-old film actor Dwight Fry was cast instead. Like Lugosi, Fry's wild-eyed portrayal would forever define the character, and is often ranked high in the pantheon of great horror performances. However, Fry would also struggle with typecasting following the film's release, often stuck playing jittery and mentally unbalanced characters. And like Renfield himself, the actor would never truly escape the shadow of Dracula. But Professor Van Helsing, modern medical science does not admit of such a creature. Veteran English actor Herbert Bunston would also reprise his role from the stage play as the stately Dr. Seward, and Francis Dade would win the career-making role of Lucy Weston. Love all you like. I think he's fascinating. Dorothy Tree, Geraldine Dvorak, and Cornelia Thaw would be uncredited in their roles as Dracula's mysterious undead brides. And Todd Browning himself also makes a cameo of sorts as the voice of the Whitby Harbor Master. Nobody goes aboard this year boat with your party. Fun fact, while Dracula's now iconic costume had originated in the stage version and was simply carried over, Lugosi would be the first count to adorn the signature medallion which was presumably added by costume designers Ed Ware and Vera West, although rumors persist that the object may have belonged to Lugosi himself, and the original prop has never been recovered. It's important to understand that while today Dracula is a household name heard the world over, at the time, the studio was nervous that American audiences weren't ready for an overt supernatural chiller with a monstrous lead. And to mitigate the risk, the budget was set at $355,000, or about $6.5 million today, a somewhat modest allotment for the time. Principal photography would begin on September 29, 1930 at Universal City, where elaborate Gothic sets were constructed conceptualized by studio art director Charles D. Hall. To cut costs, Castle Dracula was designed utilizing leftover pieces from medieval set silent productions. Likewise, the castle and Carfax Abbey would remain standing for over a decade after production ended, going on to be recycled multiple times for various Universal films throughout the 1930s. On a tight 36-day schedule, the production was, by all accounts, a bit of a mess. According to John Harker actor David Manners, director Todd Browning showed little interest in crafting the film from an artistic perspective, 
and therefore the production felt stiff and workmanlike, with few in the cast and crew outside of Bela Lugosi taking the material all that seriously. In fact, it has been said that Browning hated Fort's script so much that he could be seen tearing its pages out on set, cursing each of them as repetitive and unnecessary. Castle Dracula? Yes, that's where I'm going. To the castle. Yes. While Browning would shoot the first sequences along the Borgo Pass and Castle Dracula all in the first week, the director was a notoriously meticulous perfectionist and often fell far behind schedule, leaving other cast and crew members scrambling to pick up the slack. In fact, cinematographer Carl Freund would be forced to take on the directing role multiple times throughout filming, ending up as, essentially, the uncredited co-director. And the contributions of the German bohemian cinematographer certainly cannot be overstated. The inventor of the unchained camera, Freund was then best known for having spectacularly shot Fritz Lang's 1927 silent sci-fi opus, Metropolis and brought an artistry to the production that may have otherwise been absent in the hands of a less experienced photographer. Captured on the now-abandoned format of Sonochrome Kodak film, which saw the picture tinted in Verdant for its original release, the stock was perfect for translating the darkest darks of an image, giving Dracula a high-contrast silvery sheen that complements its heightened gothic scenery and heavy atmosphere. The decision to scale down the production from Lemley's original operatic vision to something that embraced the raw simplicity of the stage play, combined with Browning and Freund's straightforward approach, gave the film many of its now identifying qualities, broad theatrical performances, large open sets, stark ghastly shadows and rolling fog, choosing to revel and linger on a stair, or pause to allow a skin-crawling shot to unfold, rather than attempting any kind of cheap thrills or clever shots. Its special effects, being a product of their time, would also be limited and understated, mood again being prioritized over flashy spectacle, evident in the fact that Dracula's transformation into his bat shape is never seen on screen. The film also utilizes large detailed matte paintings to give an impressive scope to the Transylvanian mountainscape and the ominous Castle Dracula, with photographic effects by Frank Booth, and the paintings themselves said to have been created by glass artist Conrad Trichler, although this has never been completely confirmed. Premiering on February 12, 1931 at the Roxy Theatre in New York, and going wide across the U.S. two days later on Valentine's Day, Carl Lemley's Dracula was both a commercial and critical success, in no small thanks to its vigorous marketing campaign that fed exaggerated rumors of moviegoers fainting in the aisles over the horror of it all as well as commissioning a large and diverse variety of colorful posters to be displayed at theaters the nation over. Overseen by Universal Advertising Art Director Carolee Gross, five original posters would be produced in total, four 27-inch by 41-inch one-sheets and a 14-inch by 36-inch insert, illustrated by Gross himself. The original painted Style A poster of Lugosi's head against a dark blue backdrop of which just two known original copies still exist, is the highest-selling movie poster in the world, most recently sold for over $525,000 at Heritage Auctions in February 2020. Astonishingly, the film would go on to become Universal's highest-grossing feature of 1931, raking in a total of $700,000 in profit for the studio, or over $13 million today. This not only made Dracula a gargantuan success for the studio, but it would ultimately rescue Universal from impending financial ruin sparked by economic collapse and a string of box office misses, and would make horror cinema the backbone of Universal Pictures for nearly two decades.
as was common at the time, a silent version would be released concurrently to accommodate theaters that had not yet been wired for sound, with the intertitles added to replace the spoken dialogue. While sound in film had already dominated the industry by 1931, it was still somewhat of a novelty in certain markets, and cinematic sound pioneer Jack Foley, the namesake for modern-day Foley artists, would produce the subtle creepy soundscape that often favors unnerving silence and small sounds over intense emotionally driven music. The film does, on the other hand, possess some holdovers from the silent era, namely two expository intertitles and a close-up on a newspaper meant to further inform the audience. Additionally, the shot of the sailors struggling to save the Demeter from the storm is actually repurposed footage taken directly from Universal's 1925 seafaring silent film The Stormbreaker, which accounts for the sudden change in frame rate. We must have stories with power and punch and backbone. At the same time, we must be on the lookout for scenes or action or dialogue which are likely to give offense. The responsible men in this industry want no such pictures and will not allow these to be shown. Like so many other films, Dracula would fall prey to censorship shortly after its release with the enforcement of the Hayes Production Code. The studio forced to cut nearly 10 minutes from the film for its 1936 encore run including an epilogue featuring actor Edward Van Sloan, as well as audio from Renfield and Dracula's death sounds having to be shortened and muted. While the once lost audio was eventually recovered and restored for its home media premiere, to this day, a complete print of Van Sloan's censored final farewell has never been recovered. Soy Dracula. No podía usted ser más oportuno. Beginning in the 1920s, Hollywood studios began taking a stronger interest in appealing to foreign markets. And by 1930, Universal Pictures had zeroed in on producing solely Spanish-speaking alternative versions of their films, known as multiple language versions, or MLVs. Therefore, it came as no surprise that the studio ordered an MLV of Dracula produced concurrently alongside its English-language counterpart, although it would have only half the time to do it in, beginning principal photography on October 23, 1930, nearly a month later. Utilizing these same sets, costumes, and equipment, celebrated silent film director George Melford and his crew would arrive at night following each day's shoot, with Melford reviewing footage shot by Freund and his team and re-envisioning the scenes with his own touch. The film would also boast a talented international cast, with Spanish actor Carlos Villarías taking over for Bela Lugosi as Conde Dracula, and Spanish performer Pablo Álvarez Rubio stepping in for Dwight Fry as Renfield. Argentinian star Barry Norton portrays Juan Harker, Celebrated Mexican character actor Eduardo Arosamena plays Van Helsing, and Mexican-American up-and-comer Lupita Tobar playing Ava Seward. Adapted from Garrett Fort's screenplay by Spanish-American screenwriter Baltazar Fernandez Cue, notably, Dracula is 29 minutes longer than its English-speaking predecessor, likely the result of Melford and Cue using those missing pages from Browning's production. In addition to some spooky special effects, the Spanish version also offers more interesting shot compositions and camera movements, with cinematography by the great George Robinson. And both Robinson and Freund chose to give special attention to the Count's gaze. While in its day the film was largely looked upon as a lesser product, some now consider it to be the superior adaptation, at least from a filmmaking standpoint. Premiering in Havana, Cuba in April 1931, just two months after Todd Browning's Dracula, following two more showings in New York and Los Angeles, Dracula quickly vanished into obscurity, and went largely unseen for nearly 50 years. However, a usable, if incomplete, print of the film was miraculously uncovered in a warehouse in New Jersey, of all places, 
leading to an historic 1978 New York screening sponsored by the Museum of Modern Art. This screening re-sparked interest in the long-lost film, which led to a full restoration. In 1992, it hit the home video market for the first time in the form of a fast-selling VHS release, which further popularized the film. In 2004, it was also included in the Dracula Complete Legacy Collection DVD set. Unfortunately, with poor box office returns, Dracula would represent one of the last foreign language reproductions the studio system would produce. While the surprise financial success of Lemley's Dracula would of course spawn Universal's long string of beloved classic monster movies, it would also yield two direct sequels of its own, neither of which would involve Bela Lugosi. Although talks of a follow-up began only three weeks after its premiere, a long development period would slightly delay 1936's Dracula's Daughter, which was once again written by Garrett Fort and starred Gloria Holden as Countess Maria Zaleska, and premiered strong at the box office to mostly favorable reviews. Several years later, in 1943, Lon Chaney Jr., most famous for portraying Lawrence Talbot in Universal's The Wolfman, would play Count Anthony Alucard, that's Dracula spelled backwards, in Son of Dracula. Two more sequels, The Modern Dracula and The Return of Dracula, were discussed but never produced. In 1985, over five decades after it first scared up cinemas, Dracula would make its home media debut in the form of a standard VHS release from MCA Universal Home Video. But just three short years later, the classic monster movie would again hit video stores on Laserdisc, advertising a newly restored version of the film, and would yet again show up on shelves in 1991 as part of Universal's popular Monsters Classic Collection VHS promotion. 1999 would see its first DVD incarnation under the newly dubbed Classic Monster Collection, released alongside a special edition VHS, both allowing viewers to watch the film with musical accompaniment for the first time. Look for a special edition of Dracula. While today Dracula is notable for the absence of a traditional musical score, this was not unusual for the time, as cinematic music was viewed by most talkie-going audiences as a bit antiquated, the tool of a bygone era, and therefore the only three pieces of music heard in the film are Act Two of Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake, which opens the film, the overture to Wagner's Die Meisterzinger von Nuremberg, heard at the start of the theater scene, and the opening of Schubert's Unfinished Symphony in B minor, which ominously closes the scene. However, in 1998, award-winning composer Philip Glass was commissioned by Universal Pictures to compose an original score for the film. Performed by the Kronos Quartet and conducted by Glass's frequent collaborator Michael Reisman, Glass's score would deliver a classical 19th century sound, choosing a string quartet to revitalize the film while maintaining its old world feel adding even more emotional resonance to its images without resorting to typical horror movie beats. That same year, the score itself would be released by Nonesuch Records in conjunction with a live performance synchronized to a special showing of the film, and would later see a limited edition from Orange Mountain Music in 2007. For the first time, the 1999 DVD also included a hefty amount of bonus material for fans to sink their teeth into, including the exclusive behind-the-scenes retrospective The Road to Dracula, hosted by Carla Lemley, the late niece of Carl Lemley Sr., along with a feature-length commentary, photo galleries, and more. Universal's Monster Legacy Collections have been unleashed. It's alive, it's alive. Featuring Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Wolfman. In 2004, just five years after its DVD debut, the studio released yet another special edition DVD as part of the Universal Monsters Legacy Collection, 
marketed in step with the release of the monster-fueled blockbuster Van Helsing. Limited editions also offered a miniature collectible bust of Bela Lugosi along with Frankenstein's monster and the Wolfman as part of an exclusive gift set. This massive two-disc package also came with the same supplementary material included on the 1999 disc, in addition to three bonus films, including both of its sequels and, as aforementioned, George Melford's Spanish version. In 2006, in honor of its 75th anniversary, Universal issued another DVD under the Universal Legacy Series moniker, again recycling the 1999 bonus features. In October 2012, Dracula would at last make its Blu-ray premiere as part of the nine-film Universal Classic Monsters The Essential Collection box set, also marking the Blu-ray debut of Dracula. In 2022, Dracula would hit the Ultra HD market as a 4K release from Universal, arriving just in time for the Halloween season. In 2000, the film was selected by the U.S. Library of Congress to be preserved in the National Film Registry, citing it as culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. In 2015, its Spanish-language sibling would join it in this honor. No one leave. Todd Browning would work one other time with Bela Lugosi on 1935's Mark of the Vampire, but never fully adapted to the world of sound filmmaking. And after his final feature in 1939, the director permanently retired from the industry. I am Dracula. While Dracula would no doubt place Lugosi on the Mount Rushmore of horror movie legends, as was the case with his co-stars, the actor would fruitlessly struggle against typecasting the remainder of his career, a fate he dreaded even before filming began. And despite 25 years on the silver screen, Lugosi never managed to amount a Hollywood fortune of his own. Shortly after its release, the actor would turn down the opportunity to return to the stage as the character, stating that he hoped to never hear the name Dracula ever again. However, Lugosi famously came to embrace his shadowy alter ego, and time would undoubtedly endear the character to the star. Despite the modern-day misconception that Lugosi had gone on to play the role multiple times, the reclusive performer would only portray Stoker's famed bloodsucker on screen twice in his entire career. Although Lugosi would play vampires in three more films between 1935 and 1952, although the twist ending of Mark of the Vampire may disqualify that particular performance, it was in 1948, 17 years later, that he would make his second and final appearance as the Count himself in the universal horror comedy Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Following his death in 1956, Lugosi would indeed be buried in one of his black silk replica capes, at the request of his family. But his original Dracula cape, which was one of Lugosi's most prized possessions, had been well preserved, and would eventually be put on auction for $1.2 million in 2011. However, after it failed to sell, it was donated to the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, where it is currently being restored. Despite often being depicted as having blood-red lining, the heavy black wool opera cape Lugosi adorned on set had a taupe-colored lining, as red would have been too dark for the black and white cameras to appropriately contrast. Listen to them. Children of the night. Although Lugosi does not resemble Stoker's description of Dracula, he embodies his predatory nature and slick, skillful charm in every way. And at six foot one, the actor was able to easily tower over much of the cast. And while he may have been criticized by some of his contemporaries for delivering a larger-than-life performance, 
It is this indulgence in the presentation of his dialogue and the character's slow and deliberate mannerisms that have stood the test of time, and Lugosi is just as hypnotic to watch now as he was in his own day, a genre-defining performance in a film for the ages. How do you do? In the censored epilogue delivered by Edward Van Sloan, which was originally spoken by Dracula in the stage play and was eventually cut over concerns that it promoted belief in the supernatural, the actor delivers a final chilling send-off to us, the viewers. We hope the memories of Dracula and Renfield won't give you bad dreams. So just a word of reassurance. When you get home tonight, and the lights have been turned out, and you are afraid to look behind the curtains, and you dread to see a face appear at the window, why, just pull yourself together. And remember that after all, there are such things as vampires. So, let me know your thoughts on 1931's Dracula. Do you think it still holds up, or is it maybe too old-fashioned for your tastes? And take a minute to comment below and tell me which is your favorite Dracula movie. And as always, everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and click like below and feel free to share. And don't forget to find me on Patreon at forward slash Leighton Eversol. And of course, if you want to see more videos just like this one, go ahead and click subscribe.